Hi, this is Jorgen Rasmussen. Welcome to the Provocative Hypnosis Vlog. This episode is about Sam Harris, no free will, and the implications for psychotherapy, hypnotherapy, and coaching. So let me start off by saying this. One of the most profound and liberating discoveries that I have made in my life is the realization that free will is a myth. Now, I know that for most people, that might sound borderline insane and completely counterintuitive, but it's true. It's also one of the areas in my life, personally, where I have made a 180. I used to, as a teenager, young man in my 20s, uh, to strongly believe in free will. And then as I learned more, got a bit more sophisticated, I landed on more of a position that, well, we probably don't have that much free will, but, but clearly we have some free will, some free capacity to choose. And uh, then a bit later, both through a meditation practice and by reading, and most importantly, perhaps, uh, this book here, Free Will by, by Sam Harris, completely put the nail in the coffin for me when it came to free myth, uh, when it came to, to free will. Um, so let's talk about this uh, a little bit. Um, this is also something of a double-edged sword. So I'm going to talk about the book. I'm going to talk about the experiences that I have made uh, with clients in my actual practice. So, as Sam Harris uh, points out, the idea of free will seems to rest upon two basic ideas. The first idea being that I am the conscious source of many of my thoughts and behaviors. That's, that's the first one. And the second one that kind of logically flows from that is that I could at any point have chosen differently. So for example, I just had a beverage of Pepsi Max, you know, uh, that I bought at the, the local store right down the street. If we roll the videotape back, I have the free choice to choose to drink iced tea, for example. Now, both of these uh, ideas seem true, but they're in fact not true. And neither of them are true. And it can be a huge liberation to see that A, I'm not the conscious source of any of my thoughts and behavior. And B, at no time could I actually have acted differently. There was no such choice. So let me start off by a couple of client stories that I kind of illustrate the, the benefits of this. So at a seminar I did in Birmingham a few years ago, I worked with a young woman who uh, had a deep conviction that she was a terrible human being at her core. And we did this exercise where we looked for the terrible human being. The premise that, okay, if there is a terrible self in there, we should be able to find her. And she was never able to find that terrible self. And for many clients, that's a big relief. But she she kind of looked at me and she said, no, I, I can't find any such thing, but I wish I could because I truly am a terrible human being. And her evidence for this was that a couple of years earlier, uh, she had invited a friend out to some boat expedition, and the friend had a fluke accident on that boat expedition and died. So, so the reasoning was that she was responsible and, and could have chosen differently. So I did a thought experiment that Sam Harris talks about in his books and many of his lectures. And that is, I asked her to think of a capital or a big city somewhere in the world. And I can't remember which one came up for her. So let's just say that it was Berlin, for example. 
So, so she said Berlin. And I asked her, at the moment that you chose and said Berlin, did you have the, the free will to say Sydney, Australia? And she said, well, yes, of course. And I, I made the point that if you say yes to that question, you're, you're conflating the, 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 the fact that you know about Sydney, Australia. It's, it's part of your repertoire. Big cities, that's true. But the choice Berlin was the end result of completely invisible processes that you can't see and that you didn't choose. All you really have access to is the end result of that process, which manifested as Berlin. Now, if the end result of that process is Berlin, it's Berlin. There's, there's no freedom to choose that which doesn't appear. I'll say that again. There's, if Helsinki does not appear, there is no freedom to choose Helsinki. There, there, there's no freedom to choose that which doesn't appear. And you might even say, let's say that, let's say that uh, Berlin first appeared, and then Helsinki appeared, and then she chose Berlin. Uh, you might then say, well, in that case, she had the free will to ultimately land at Berlin. So you could say, yeah, we can change our mind, but if we do, that's also the end result of completely invisible processes that we can't see and that we didn't choose. So it's it's just as mysterious, and there is no more free will involved. So she got it. She she had a visceral moment of realizing that, oh shit. Uh, what happened two years ago was another Berlin moment. In fact, my entire life has been one Berlin moment after the next. I, I never had the choice, the free will to choose differently. At, at the state that the universe and my brain was in at that particular time, that's what emerged. And, and for her, this dissolved the notion that she was a terrible human being. Shame, self-hatred, uh, deep self-criticism, it all, it all went. And I have feedback uh, over time that, that, that shows that that realization has held up. Um, so, so that's one example of a really liberating outcome, paradoxically, as a result of, of seeing that there never was any choice uh, freely for things to be otherwise. Because if, if you're going to hate yourself or hate someone else for doing something, you have to attribute to yourself or to the other person the, the free will that, okay, they, they did this freely and they had the capacity to freely choose something else. And the fact that they chose to do this despite having a different choice makes them bad and makes them terrible and makes them the, uh, the subject um, of, or the object, I should say, of our hate. So that's one example. Another example is I worked with a woman a few years ago who, who struggled with panic attacks and, and anxiety. And she mentioned it as having a drill sergeant in her head, like an inner dictator. That, 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 that was constantly criticizing her and commanding her to be on top of things and to be in control and criticizing her for not being perfect. And it it drove her completely crazy. And, and to her, th this looked like who she was. It, it looked as if she essentially was fused uh, and identified with, with that internal voice or dialogue. And, and she also had the belief that she was responsible for those thoughts because they were hers, you know, that they're mine, you know, I'm thinking this, I'm the architect of this. And, and 
And of course, the fact that she held herself responsible for those thoughts, being the thinker of them, you know, just increased her stress levels through the roof. Now, during the session that we did together, I was in this very serene, peaceful flow state where things just emerged. And she seemed to just kind of meet me there. And we just spent time in that space. And her thinking process completely slowed down. So when she walked out the office, she was completely serene. She got into her car to drive home. And the first thing she discovered was that her tinnitus was gone. Now, she had no idea that such a thing could even happen. And she hadn't mentioned to me that she had tinnitus either. I, I had no clue. But, but she suddenly just realized that it was gone. Not only that, the inner dictator was gone as well. And if, <laughs> she was completely peaceful. But, but then she had this quick thought of, shit, how am I going to get home? Because she was so used to this inner dictator dictating her every move. And uh, she drove home perfectly. And this lasted for a week and a half. So for a week and a half, she had virtually no self-referential thinking. Worry about the future, uh, regretting, reconstructing the past, uh, thinking about how she came across any internal dialogue about having to perform, it was all completely blown out. The only thing that would appear would be like very practical, task-oriented thoughts uh, relevant to the situation that she was in. But there was very little thinking, and she was profoundly at peace. And this lasted for a week and a half. After a week and a half, the tinnitus came back a little bit, and some of the internal dialogue and the anxiety came back. But, but she said to me, that week and a half has changed my life forever. Because what she realized was, was that she was fully functional. You know, her, her kids still got food. She still ended up uh, at work, did her assignments. Uh, she was able to do everything that she knew to do. And she was actually even more efficient at it and more at peace without any of the self-referential thinking going on. And, and that was so liberating because she had the clear experience that, that these thoughts were not at all essential or relevant. She was completely functional without them. And the, the fact that, that her being remained while the thoughts were gone showed her clearly that, that she was not identical to those thoughts that were not essential to who she was. Neither was she the creator of them, neither was she responsible for them, neither did they say anything in particular about her. And, and, and that was a huge liberation. We actually came up together with the analogy of the sports commentator, where, where she said, you know, I, I used to think that this was me and, and I was in charge, but after this experience, I realized that it's more like watching gymnastics in the Olympics. You know, for, for a very naive viewer who's never watched it before, it might look as if the commentators, the sports commentators, are making the athletes do their somersaults and, and stuff like that because there's some overlap between what they're saying and what's happening on the mats. But the reality is that. If the sound suddenly got caught from the, the booth, you know, uh, the athletes would still be doing their stuff. The, the sports commentators uh, are not making the athletes do. So I highly recommend, once again, buying Sam Harris's book, Free Will, because he one reason why I enjoy listening to him and reading uh, his views, especially on topics such as these, is the combination of him having a background as a neuroscientist, um, a philosopher, and a long-term meditator. So it's relatively rare that someone has a lot of competency in 
evaluating both the kind of third-person objective science in the lab where you look at how the brain operates. And he refers to the typical Benjamin LeBay experiments and other similar experiments that show that uh, while doing EEG or, or fMRI, that, that the brain has actually decided to do stuff long before we consciously get the feeling and recognition uh, of the decision, and which then kind of deludes us into thinking that we're consciously doing it and, and being the author of it. So, so there, there's since 1983, I think, the first Benjamin LeBay study, that there's just like neuroscience experiments after neuroscience experiments where, where, where the evidence is, is extremely strong that, that there, there's no there's no place or center or captain of the ship in the brain uh, or, or a conductor of the orchestra and and that the brain has decided long before our conscious minds uh, become aware of anything so there's a kind of spooky conclusion to that and that is that for, for pretty solid stretches of times you may think that you have the complete freedom of will or choice, your brain has actually decided. And that's a that, that, that's a kind of weird, weird idea. <clears throat> now, if you meditate, something else that he points out that I really like from the book is that he says that the illusion of free will is in and of itself an illusion. You know, some people might say, well, you know, of course, everything that appears is the end result of invisible unconscious processes that we, you know, can't see and, and didn't choose. But but that doesn't really change anything because, you know, these unconscious processes are just as just as much me as 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 the conscious mind is. Um, but. The the thing is that. Free will is the opposite side of the coin of feeling that you are a self. Feeling fused and identified with a collection of thoughts and feelings. So when, when people talk about free will, they, they really talk about that feeling of being a captain of the ship, of being the author of the book, of, of being the thinker of the thoughts or the, the feeler of the feelings. Right now, the, the the trick here is that if you meditate and you really you know have some concentration power and and some some sensory clarity, you'll notice that thoughts just appear and feelings just appear. There's just one thought, one feeling after the other, and if if you look for the thinker or the feeler or the decider, you'll never find it. The, the notion of a thinker behind the thoughts is just an afterthought. The, the notion of a thinker is just another thought. It's a subsequent thought in, in the chain of thoughts. <clears throat> it's, it's a bit like the clown who runs up on stage after a theater performance, bows and takes credit for the performance, but this clown from the audience was not actually a part of the performance. So the magic trick that occurs here, for example, is, you know, the, the process of seeing happens. The, the process of hearing is going on. The, the process of thinking, the process of feeling. And then after the fact, this I thought appears and takes credit and says, I saw that or I was the thinker of that, or I was the decider of that, or I chose that. But, but the reality is that, that that I thought, that ad hoc entity that shows up after the fact and claims credits is an afterthought. It, it was not actually there during the performance. It makes it seem as if what came after actually was there before the activity and the initiator of it. And it's, it's this magic trick that, that makes it seem 
as if we have. But, but, but if you really observe the thinking process, you'll see very clearly that um, there's just one thought after the next. It's, it's just appearing. There, there's no thinker behind the thoughts. Thought itself is the thinker. Now you you might say, well, you know that's that's fine, but you know I I can choose to lift my arm right now. You know I can choose to to turn this podcast on. I I can choose to to go for a walk. I I can plan things and then execute them. You know clearly that shows that I have free will. But but this is the exact same illusion that you can discover to be an illusion through meditation. Yes, there's a distinction to be made between volitional and non-volitional activity, but the truth is intentions just appear. So w when we feel as if we have free will, you know, there, 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 there's, there's a felt sense of having an intention to do something and to kind of be lost in that thought, right? The reality of it is that intentions also just appear. Decisions just appear. Plans just appear. You don't know what intentions you have until they appear. And the intentions that appear also emerge out of the darkness, so to speak. They, they emerge out of invisible, unconscious, unconscious processes that you can't see. Or that you didn't choose. So back to Sam Harris again. Uh, he's pretty clear that that the argument here is not dependent upon a materialist um, orientation. Uh, and in many places, he, he he does claim to be an agnostic in terms of the nature of consciousness. So so for example, today. There, there really isn't even a good hypothesis or any evidence, really, of how dead matter neurons somehow uh, generate uh, or produce the experience of, of life or being alive. Um, now, there, there, there's been found a lot of correlations between different forms of neural activity and activation in the brain and particular subjective uh, experiences. But, but that doesn't prove that one causes the other. So Sam does seem to use a kind of cause and effect model here where he kind of says that these unconscious processes cause these subjective experiences. Um, I think that Donald Hoffman, the cognitive scientist, <clears throat> has a very interesting point where he says, look, the, the fact that certain processes seem to be at play right before certain subjective experiences doesn't prove that they cause them any more than the fact that if you walk to your local train station and there's a bunch of people you know, they're waiting for the train before the train appears. Well, the, the fact that there's a bunch of people waiting for the train before it appears uh, doesn't really prove that the people standing there waiting for the train causes the train to appear either. So that is, that is an interesting point. Now, there, there, there are some potential downsides to this as well. So I'll give you a couple of examples. I'll, I'll find Sam's book again here. He, he, he writes a little bit about politics, and I think this might be one of the weak, one of the weak points of his argument. I'll quote from his, his book here. For better or worse, uh, dispelling the illusion of free will has political implications because liberals and conservatives are not equally enthralled to it. Liberals tend to understand that a person can be lucky or unlucky in all matters relevant to his success. Conservatives, however, often make a religious fetish out of individualism. 
Many seem to have absolutely no awareness of how fortunate one must be to succeed at anything in life. No matter how hard one works, one must be lucky to be able to work. One must be lucky to be intelligent, physically healthy, and not bankrupted in middle age by the illness of a spouse. Um, Yet living in America, one gets the distinct sense that if certain conservatives were asked why they weren't born with club feet or orphaned before the age of five, they would not hesitate to take credit for these accomplishments. Now, the claim uh, that, that Sam Harris has, and which I also believe, is that seeing through the illusion of free will uh, naturally leads to you being more compassionate. It takes away the... the the basis for hatred and and shame and also entitlement and, and narcissism to some extent. You kind of realize that if you're intelligent and hardworking and conscientious and all of that, deep down you really have no credit for that. You, you didn't create it. These things also emerge out of the dark just like everything else. However, and I'm not a conservative, I'm not a liberal either, I'm more of a classical liberal or libertarian in my preferences. But if you read Jonathan Haidt, the psychologist who does a lot of research into morals and ethics and, and politics, um, it, it, it's pretty clear that liberals talk a lot more about compassion and diversity and, and, and that sort of stuff but Republicans or conservatives are actually way more generous than liberals. Uh, they're way more generous. This is true in a group level, obviously, not necessarily on an individual level. But they're, they're more generous with their time. They're more generous with their money, with donations, with, with um, engaged in their local communities. Uh, and this is true for all like social economic uh, classes. So. So rich conservatives are more generous uh, with their time, with their money, with their energy uh, than, than rich liberals. And, and poor uh, conservatives are also way more generous with these things than liberals. And uh, it's kind of interesting because many of these conservatives probably are religious and probably truly believe uh, in free will and that they have free will. Um, so that's something to consider. Something else to consider here is, while it's true that seeing through the illusion of free will can make you more compassionate and, and can, can take away the basis for hatred, Sam seems to argue as if that's a foregone conclusion, as if that's automatically going to happen. I've seen with clients that it's not necessarily so. So, for example, sometimes you could make an argument that we don't hate someone because we believe they can change. We, we, we believe that on some level they have the, the volition to be better or do better. right? And if you completely take that away, you could, I'm not saying that you will, but you, you could also land with the conclusion that, shit, you know, this person over there is, is just a defect robot. That's just his or her nature, and, and to hell with that, you know. Uh, that could just as well easily happen. And there, there's another unfortunate potential consequence here, too, and that is victimhood. So a, a while back, I, I read a very interesting book by a British prison psychiatrist called Theodore Dalrymple, which is obviously his writing name, but it's really cool. Name. And it's called The Knife Went In. One of the amusing observations that he made in spending time with murderers, you know, as a, as a prison doctor and prison psychiatrist, is that when they told the story of what they'd done, uh, it almost always, without exception, stopped with, and then the knife went in. There was no ownership. It was never, I stabbed her, or I did this. It was just, the knife went in. And um, uh, 
It seems that when people improve and become more mature and develop more capacity for choice, they go from the knife went in to I made that happen. I did that. Consider if if someone, you know, a family member or your spouse, you know, did something, uh, you know, kind of cruel or made some serious mistake. The, the, the vast difference between an apology stated as I'm sorry that that happened versus I'm really sorry I did that. The, 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 the latter has a level of ownership that makes the apology uh, more trustworthy, more authentic uh, th th than the one that just abdicates all responsibility and essentially says, look, the, the knife went down. And I remember I worked uh, a year back in 2000, 2001 as, as a consultant for the government for, for the long-term unemployed. And... If there's one thing I've learned is that there's nothing worse than victimhood. Like, like the, 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 the most toxic mind virus there is, is victimhood. The most greedy, entitled, least compassionate, most violent uh, people you can find are the people who truly identify as victims. And that's the problem with the whole the knife went in argument, right? If you fundamentally view yourself as a victim, that's just being acted upon by, by, by other people, that's, that's problematic. And, and when, when you look at psychotherapy, when you look at coaching, you, you, you see that for the most part, Clients will come in and say, you know, he made me do that, and she makes me feel, and this situation makes me like this. And our job is to help them kind of go just like they do in CBT, right? Well, we have A, the activating events. You know, your, your, your spouse says something. And then we have C, you know, your feelings of being hurt and lashing out, the consequences. But in between, we have a B. We have your beliefs. We have your interpretations. We have how you make sense out of experience, right? So our job, for the most part, is to focus people on B and to help them realize time and time again that they're experiencing their thinking, that they're experiencing a story and an, an interpretation. Right? Um, and, and, and to help them to... to differentiate their own inner experience from other people's expectations and behaviors and projections and to help them differentiate other people from their own projections and, and expectations. And that requires a self. You know, it requires a sense of a self to be able to say, these are my opinions and these are that's what I'm going to vote and these are my expectations uh that's your views you know that's mine you know um the the ability to do this seems to seems to necessitate that we develop a psychological self of sorts however illusory it is because if if you speak to the the knife went in type folks which I've also had the opportunity to do on a few occasions, you, you'll see that they, they don't really have a psychological sense of self that's, that has the capacity to really think and plan into the future and to have good boundaries and, and, and to, to... Like, that's not really there. So, as some folks have said in the meditation world, I call Jack Angler, you know, he used to say, before you can be nobody, you, you have to be somebody. So if you look at, for example, the famous psychiatrist, William Glasser, who was extremely successful in working with young delinquent, you know, troubled teens uh, by, by, cheap, by, by teaching them choice theory or what he called reality therapy at the time, you know, these teenagers would very often have the victimhood, the, the short-term hedonistic, uh, you're just a supplier to myself type attitude. 
And he would socialize them. He would give them a framework and an ideology. And one of them was the, the notion of free will and personal responsibility and, and that you actually choose. And I, I see this <clears throat> I see this so often with clients too, you know, that that going from being a victim to having the sense that 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 I choose and, and, and that I kind of am the captain of the ship is well it's an illusion, but it's an improvement. It's it's a big, big improvement. So where I think Sam might not quite be be making the distinction is, you see, <clears throat> also, I'll get back to what I was just about to start, but I've had clients who I've guided to see that there's, there's no free will, and they've dropped into a depression afterwards, you know, because one person said, look, it's a bit like being the captain of the ship and feeling that you have the choice to navigate the ship differently and then kind of being the captain of the ship and realizing that you really have no choice. Like, like that's kind of depressing. <clears throat> so one reason why I really recommend a meditation practice and, and to really explore the illusory nature of selfing or the self is that if, if it's clearly seen that the self is an illusion, there's no such thing as a self in here, then it's no longer that you don't have free will or that you have free will. It's revealed that there's no I or no self to have it to begin with. And that's way more liberating because you, you don't want to leave someone with the notion that they are the self, they, they, they are the captain of the ship suddenly went from having choice to not having choice. If someone can, re but, but if someone instead can kind of have the realization that there is no captain there to have that choice, that, that the entire ship, the entire trip, the, the waves, uh, everything is just kind of, everything is just kind of appearing. That is very liberating. So there's a huge difference between someone who meditates, discovers that there's no such thing as a self, and thereby no I or self to have that free will, where everything is just kind of unfolding as it is naturally unfolding. <clears throat> there's a big difference between that and a person who hasn't really developed a sense of self to begin with, who sees himself as a victim, and who kind of says that the knife went in. So really emphasizing no free will, probably for the most part, is probably in most in instances not a good idea, un unless people have uh, constructed a solid, autonomous sense of self to begin with. Although, I'm not so sure that the two clients I just mentioned had done that. And I've seen young people, teenagers, who clearly haven't done that, who've been tormented by thoughts, and who found a, a, a huge relief in just realizing that, shit, they're, they're not mine. I'm not responsible for them. I, I sometimes joke with, with clients, you know, when, when when they sit there and and they tell me their story and and they're they're having a rough time, and I'll point to the client and I'll say, "Have you noticed that you're suffering a lot and I'm not really suffering at all?" And it's like they they, they look at me with this like, "You bastard, you asshole!" Like orientation. They look. That's pretty obvious. But here's something that might not be obvious. I have to think the exact same thoughts that you think to understand what you're talking about. So when you say that the future is bleak or that you're not enough or or uh, <clears throat> or uh, that you have to perform or be perfect, I have to kind of try those thoughts on to understand what you're talking about. I'm having the same thoughts as you are, but I'm not suffering. And they often perk out and go, oh. And the reason is, 
that in your mind, when these thoughts appear, there's other thoughts that claim credit for those thoughts and says, oh, these are mine. This is me. These are my thoughts. Whereas that's not happening for me. It's more like they're your thoughts, right? So, so as a result of that, there's, there's really no suffering. Now, finally, none of this means, of course, the fact that we can change our relationship to thinking or realize that we are thinking or, or change our stories, none of this implies free will, really. It just seems as if we kind of have to develop a illusory sense of self to be able to make those sorts of distinctions. So let's take, for example, uh, the first movie that was shown back in 1895 in Paris of a train coming towards the audience where allegedly, you know, quite a few people leaped from their seats in terror, you know, thinking they were going to be run over by the train. Now, you and I don't do that. You and I never do that when we see trains on the screen. The reason why we don't do that is, in a sense, because we have more freedom. We, we have a freer map. You know, we can, we can do all sorts of different things because we have a different understanding of film. But we don't have any more free will. Our understanding of film and our responses even though they're freer because they're based upon a richer map of what movies are like, in that sense we're freer, but there's no free will involved. The same goes with change work. You know, if, if, if someone comes into your office, you give them tasks, you guide them through various experiments, they may have insights, they may develop psychological skills that help them in ways that are profound. So I'm not saying that people can't change, but what I am saying is that whether it ever occurs to a client to come to your office, whether they're able to make sense of anything that you're suggesting, whether they actually have an insight, whether they're motivated to, to do their tasks and what they get out of the tasks, this is all up for grabs. This all emerges out of the dark so to speak. So again, I'd highly recommend getting that book, Free Will. I really love Sam Harris <clears throat> as an author. I, I, I think his writing is superb. And I think he has a knack for writing books that are extremely relevant for our times. So the Free Will book, extremely relevant. His book, The Moral Landscape, where, where he argues, in my mind, very compellingly against moral relativism uh, and, and argues that, that science can have a place in determining morals and ethics. Uh, I found that to be a great read. Also his book, Waking Up, which I would have wished had been more in-depth in terms of meditation, but, but the, the effort to, to, to really make a distinction between spirituality uh, and religion uh, is great. Although where I seem to differ a little bit from Sam Harris is that he seems to be more optimistic that a realization that there's no such thing as free will will necessarily make someone more compassionate, less hateful, less entitled. Uh, and in my experience working with clients, yeah, that can often be the case. You can make a, a, a setting where, where it's more likely that's the case, but it's, it's not necessarily going to be the case at all. Just like the example with the, the liberals and the, the Republicans. And some brains also may not really be able to do compassion. So let's say someone's extremely psychopathic. And they have a realization that there's no such thing as a self or, or, or you know, the, the flip side of it, that, that there is no free will. Uh, will that person necessarily be any more uh, compassionate, uh, doubtful, very, very doubtful? Um, by the way, this is a, when, when you look at meditation here, you know, as a final point, 
Um, one of the first things that we often discover is just how crazy we are. Because we, we could, for most people, just kind of appear, right? So that monkey mind phenomenon and just discovering how crazy we are. Now, that discovery can, for some people, be extremely liberating. But for other people, it, 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 can, it can generate a, a experience of hopelessness and, and helplessness. You, you, you never know. You, you never know. Now, paradoxically, if you continue to meditate, you increase your ability to set an intent and to stay focused, right? So you're freer in, in that sense. But there is no more free will involved. And... If you practice meditation or study with a meditation teacher, uh, one kind of nice way of, of determining your own progress is, you know, in terms of seeing through the self-illusion is, you know, does the person still think that they're in control? Do they still think that they have free will or that they are the age, the, the, the captain of the ship? Uh, so so the the the, self, the the illusion of being a self and the illusion of free will are, are two sides of the same coin. So, anyways, I I hope this was useful. Uh, if my ideas resonate and, and you're looking to make some change in your life, you can work with me as a client by reaching out at provocativehypnosis.com. I'm also available for seminars and mentoring. So, till next time.